Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. What if? In 1943, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his White House advisors had acted on the knowledge that high-ranking German officials had conceived a bold plot to kidnap Hitler and his top officials and, pre and were prepared to turn them over to the United States to end the war with Germany. What if, after capturing Hitler and not needing to fight Germany to the bitter end for its unconditional surrender, we agreed to an armistice and joined forces with Germany to stop Soviet communist, the communist Soviet Union in its bid to conquer all of Eastern Europe and in doing so, closing it behind an iron curtain that would endure for over four decades. World events might have turned out quite differently if FDR had acted on the counsel of this one man, George H. Earl III. He didn't, and the rest, they say, is history. Here to tell the story is Chris Farrell, the Director of Investigations and Research at Judicial Watch and author of Exiled Emissary, The Story of George Earl. And in returning to the show, I think this is your third or fourth time, thankfully, <laughs> uh, Dr. Shea Bradley Farrell, author of Last Warning to the West, which we talked about last time about Hungary, um, who's the founder of Counterpoint Institute and has written extensively on the agonies of Eastern Europe under communism. Chris, Shay, now I think I noticed some similarity here. You both have the same last name. <laughs> so you two might know each other before Very coming well. on the show. But as I understand it, this is the first show you've done together. Well, <laughs> we've done shows together like on OAN <clears throat> or podcast his podcast, but no one's ever pointed out that we were married and no one's noticed. <laughs> so we, we just, we have a good working so we'll relationship. Go with the we flow. just go with the flow. So this, I've read the book and I try to read all, all the stuff that we talk about on the show, but this one's particularly interesting because it's one of those stories that when you read it, it seems absolutely true and yet nobody knows about it. It is absolutely true. I have a document, I have a record for every single fact issue or point in the book and so it isn't speculative it isn't hypothetical it's not one of uh, these books that sort of examines an alternative history everything in the book is documented either from something out of the national archives something from the pennsylvania state archives in harrisburg or at the pennsylvania historical society in pennsylvania or <clears throat> personal records <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> personal records from either uh, the Earl family or actually even from my own grandfather, who was business partners with uh, George Earl. So and just to do your background a bit, you've spent 20, 25, 30 years in military intelligence, and, and you're now director of investigations for Judicial Watch, so this is your home turf. Yeah, so <clears throat> I was a counterintelligence officer and a human intelligence officer, a clandestine human, a CIA trained case officer. Right. I did that for about 10 years. Um, then I got out. I did a, some contracting work. I taught school for a while. But then since 1999, so for the last 25 years, I've been the director of intel, uh, investigations and research at Judicial Watch. And you encouraged him. To, you, 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 I guess you saw this stack of papers lying around in Chris, Chris library and said, what are you doing? Well, he You're told not, you... me about it. Um, actually, when we were dating, he told me he had all these documents that had been classified documents, some, some of them. Right. But they were from the National Archives. And he had spent like 15 years collecting this data. He had also interviewed George Earl's son, grandson. No, his son. He his had son. a 94-year-old son who was in a nursing home outside of Philadelphia, and I went and interviewed him. He's quite a character. He was an OSS officer in World War II at the time that his dad was serving as the naval attache in Istanbul. So and, the whole family well, is fascinating. Well, let's jump into your description of him. He's a mainline Philadelphia millionaire. True. 
family was quite wealthy, but he he he, he added wealthy. he added to the family wealth. He, he was a successful businessman. He Indeed. was a war hero, awarded the Navy Cross. In World War One, he mm-hmm. took his uncle's yacht that had been converted into a Navy Reserve submarine chaser. He took the family boat out for he a did. cruise for the Navy. <laughs> an, an eighty an eighty foot yacht that they converted for Naval Reserve use. As a submarine chaser, he patrolled the Atlantic coast along New Jersey and, uh, and Delaware. The ship caught fire. The engine room burst into flame. He saved the ship, no hands lost, in the middle of winter, and uh, was awarded the Navy Cross in, during World War I. And that's just sort of the preamble of this guy's life. He's a fascinating character. And, and to, your, to the point before, Bill, he told me he had all this research already. And being a PhD, a researcher myself, I was like, why haven't you written this book? This is a researcher's dream. So he, he set about and, and did it. And the other thing is he has a, a personal connection, his grandfather, with his grandfather. Yeah. So or George Earl, as you mentioned, uh, mainline Philadelphia family millionaire. His family dates back to colonial days. He's like the great great grandnephew of Benjamin Franklin. Um, enormously wealthy family. He owned one of his holdings was something called the Flamingo Sugar Mill. And Flamingo Sugar, at the turn of the century, last century, was sort of the equivalent of Domino Sugar now. It was the dominant figure in, in retail sugar. Um, my Maternal grandfather, Jack Fitzgerald, was a founding member of the New York Coffee and Sugar Exchange, a commodities broker. And his chief client was George Earl and Flamingo Sugar. So they were great business partners, but also very close personal friends. And that's really how I even came to know about George Earl, was my grandmother bragging about how my grandfather uh had known and worked with Governor Earl. That's how they always referred to him. He was Pennsylvania him. governor. He was also ambassador to Austria, Austria and Bulgaria. Both. And he was a close friend of FDR. Yeah, they went to, mm-hmm. they went to Harvard together for a while. George Earl quit Harvard, went off to Europe to run around and have fun. But that's how they knew each other from basically being He was teenagers. one of the top polo players in the world. He was, absolutely true. <laughs> um, so one of the other little twists to this whole thing is that the reason why my, why my grandmother was bragging to me about my grandfather's involvement with George Earl was that in March of 1936, a very dark time in Germany, my grandfather had a friend and business partner on the commodities exchange named Max Meyer, a, a ethnically German Jewish businessman, now American. And they wanted to get their business friends out of Frankfurt and uh, because the, of the suppression, the oppression of the Jews in Frankfurt in, in around 1936. And so Max Meyer had gone to my grandfather and said, hey, you're buddies with Earl. Earl's the governor of Pennsylvania. He just came from being the ambassador to Vienna. He's got to know people in Washington. He knows FDR. Get these people some visas so they can get out. And so my, I, and I have the letters. My grandfather communicated with Earl, and in fact, they saved several Jewish businessmen and their families out of Nazi Germany in 1936. And so my grandmother, I'm a child, I'm like eight or 10 years old, and my grandmother's bragging to me about how my grandfather had gotten these people out of Nazi Germany working with George Earl. And that planted the seed in my head, and that's why I pursued the story. So George Earl, friends of FDR, was an extreme, he was an extreme, he was a playboy, but he also was a good businessman, extreme extrovert. He got to know everybody in Vienna, got to know everybody in Bulgaria. Correct. Uh, They trusted him. And I think he also had an affair with the woman who was the nightclub singer. He did, yeah. And Everybody loves that story. A stunning willowy well, blonde. You've got, a, you've got a picture of her in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody right. loves it. All the men love that story. She looks great. I mean, let's see if yeah. we can't, we, we'll dig this Zoom in on we can't get a yeah. <laughs> Adrian Molnar. Yeah. She, was, she got quite around, didn't she? She, she was did. in, she was covered by the British, uh, anyway, all the agencies were very interested <laughs> in her. For and, a variety of reasons. 
<laughs> and but but then so he developed these relationships. He spoke German. He did, and so he was he was one of the reasons I think the German high command. Now let let's set the stage here. The Germans are in in the ascendance. Nazis are in the ascendant. Hitler, Hitler's in charge. World War Two kicks off. They're winning. Then by 1943, though, it becomes clear that perhaps Germany wasn't going to win, perhaps Germany had overextended itself, and that this thing was going to be a catastrophe for Germany, and particularly after FDR, in an offhanded remark, said, we demand unconditional surrender. At the Casablanca conference in January of 43, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, let's first talk about FDR's blunder with unconditional surrender. What, did that, what were the implications of that? Well, that really put the German high command, the German military leadership in a box. Because now you're not offering any other way out, no other conclusion to the war, except absolute unconditional surrender, right? A term really that was coined in our civil war. Uh, I'm not sure, no one really knows why FDR glommed onto it. Churchill claims to have been surprised by uh, the statement that it was not coordinated with him at the Casablanca conference. They came out of that conference, they had a, a press event, and uh, FDR blurts this out. The, the consequences for the German military is that you have got a very long military you know, uh, history and tradition within the German officer corps. And they've taken a personal oath to the Fuhrer, right, to, to Hitler. And so you put them in the position where they can't turn over and surrender their troops without breaking their oath. And you're asking them to dishonor themselves. There's no negotiation. There's no armistice. There's, World War One was settled with an armistice, but there's no option for that now. Well, I don't think I, we. I grew up hearing unconditional surrender. We all did in the movies or whatever. But sure. this was really unique, almost unique in history. Unprecedented. Wars were never fought with the notion that the other society is going to have to unconditionally surrender. Mm -hmm. Correct. Which raised the stakes yes. beyond uh, belief. Now, did FDR give any thought to this, or this was one of the things he did after a couple of martinis? This is a great <laughs> conundrum. There's no he liked his martinis. We he know did. that. <laughs> there's, there's no simple answer to that question. There's no definitive. FDR himself was interviewed on it, and he treats it really in a very cavalier way. He kind of just shrugs it off like, oh, well, you know, it was a great talking point. It really made us sound like we were tough. And not realizing that, one thing is a rhetorical argument. Another thing is shifting facts for, for military officers. So the military, off, the, the high, high command in Germany, which was beginning to doubt Hitler. I mean, Hitler was a, he took sole control of the command and ignored the experience of all his generals and did engage in a lot of blunders. And I guess at some point they said, we've got to get out of this. And Stalingrad, of course, happens at the same time, roughly, as January 43. So the German, an entire German army led by a field marshal is surrounded and entrapped, right, and lost. And that was an enormous sort of shift of weight. Uh, well, the... and, and, and Hitler's very good reason for wanting to conquer Stalingrad, it was named after Stalin. And he thought that would be a juicy target to be able to conquer Stalingrad to show, you know, he had the whip hand on it. It was, had no strategic purpose. None other than they had, they dug themselves into a position and they weren't going to back away from it. Yeah. So who went to Earl and what happened next? And I also want to talk in depth about who was surrounding FDR in the White House, yeah. because that bears... This is the part that I use in my book with the German resistance yeah, you write, you write going about to this. Earl, because, and I'll, I'll let you tell the story about it, because um, Earl came to FDR, as you mentioned in the beginning, and said, we will give you, uh, the German resistance has said, they will give us Hitler, but in exchange, we have to, the U.S. has to go against the Soviet Union, and FDR would not do that. And you're talking about the uh, communist connections and the communists that were in his administration. But the uh, again, I will let you talk about it. <laughs> but the the thing that fascinated me about the story is that the German resistance had said to Earl, "We are concerned about the Soviets advancing, not just on them." but on Europe in changing the culture and the ideology. 
of Central Europe and of Europe, and, and certainly that's what happened when we <clears throat> gave Russia or the Soviet Union uh, Central Europe. It was a civilizational threat, yeah. right? The Europeans can kind of go after each other every 30 or 40 years like they do in you know, Germany they did for about a thousand years. Correct. Yeah. But it was never a civilizational threat. Right. And what the Soviets, what the, the Bolshevik Marxists sought to do was erase Christianity, erase history. You know, they were, they were going to create an entirely new existence. And the Germans saw that and said, look, the Soviets are the real threat. Uh, don't mind our sort of intramural uh, fighting that we do on and off again. Uh, these guys are going to rewrite the world. They're going to rewrite history. And they did. And they did. <clears throat> so in, October, in late January 43, the Casablanca Conference is early January 43. Late January 43, George Earl finds himself uh, as a lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy Reserve at 53 years old, which is kind of funny uh, age-wise. But he's asked FDR, his old buddy, to, hey, post me overseas. I want to be the naval attache in Istanbul. He comes up with his own job. He invents it. And FDR says, okay, because <laughs> it's his friend. So he lets And him... also, he's given a lot of money to FDR's campaign. That, that's another yeah. point. While he was, <laughs> while he was, before he was even governor, back in 32, he had given hundreds of thousands of dollars, 1932 dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars to FDR's campaign. So surprise, surprise, he's ambassador to Vienna. He goes home and becomes governor. Then he goes and he's appointed as ambassador uh, in Sofia, Bulgaria. Well, the war breaks out, so he can't be ambassador there anymore. So he gets his position as U.S. Naval Attaché in Istanbul. Now, Istanbul in that time, maybe for, for forever, really, was I think of the movie Casablanca. And you should. Yeah. You and, should. And, and all the intrigue and that every different country had somebody there, all yep. the swirling, all the spies. That all is the, correct. All the uh, intrigue. <clears throat> Uh -huh. That was that was in Istanbul in nineteen in the early nineteen forties. Absolutely. And in fact, what what was the connection to that movie in your book? Yeah. So I mean, so you'll <laughs> well, remember the bar the, the, the bar, bar scene. Fight, the bar scene. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right, with the band playing. <laughs> yeah. That is actually derived from George Earl being in Sofia, Bulgaria. And so while he was ambassador in Bulgaria just before the U.S. entered the war, the Germans were using Sofia, Bulgaria as a R and R spot. They were hanging out there, having fun, <clears throat> out of the out of combat, but in a good position. The scene in Casablanca, which is produced two years after the event we're talking about right now, was based upon George Earl getting in a bar fight over a band playing. George Earl wanted the band to play Tipperary, <laughs> which was a not very pleasant gesture to the Germans that were in this nightclub bar. The Germans want to hear the Horst Vessel lead, which is the Nazi, like, uh, party uh, sure. yeah. theme. And so there's a back and forth that results in a fight. Earl's hustled out of the bar. He had clocked a German in the head with a champagne bottle. And it was quite a big deal to the point where... Well, he also got clocked. He did as well. He was pretty well beaten up in the process. Yeah. But... <laughs> Uh, he's hustled out of the bar by a combination of co uh, press correspondents that are with him and some Bulgarian taxi drivers. But let's let's also remind ourselves he has he was the former governor of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. ambassador of Austria, <laughs> yep. a multimillionaire in the '30s, yep. independently a polo wealthy. player. I mean, this was this was a very high concept guy. Yeah, he was. He yeah. and you know, very <laughs> frankly, and I put this in the book, he drank too much. He chased <laughs> women. He was a very uh, he had a very exciting life, let's put it that way. And but part of the, the thing with Earl, and I interviewed his 94-year-old son in a <laughs> nursing home in Philadelphia, and his son turned to me and said, look, he would do any damn thing he felt like. He was sort of Trump before Trump, really. Right, that's what I was going to say. That's what you say about him, because, um, you know, he also came to FDR and said, hey, it was the Soviets that did the Kachin massacre of 20,000 yeah, uh, intellectuals, yeah. right? Well, um, just following on that, you know, he got exiled, right? I know we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But yeah, he was very Trumpian because he was ca canceled before, you know, 
uh, being counseled was cool. He was sent to exile for saying what he believed to FDR. So the bar scene happens, and then at what point do the Germans approach him to, okay. with, their, with their idea? So this late January 43, Earl is very well known to the Germans. He had been ambassador in Vienna, right? He had been ambassador in Sofia, Bulgaria. They knew both him as sort of a character, but the Germans also knew that he was personally linked to FDR, that he was now in Istanbul, not just as the U.S. naval attache, which is very thin diplomatic cover, but that he had an appointment, literally, as, the, as FDR's personal representative to the Balkans. Yeah. That was part of his title. So the Germans are very well aware of who he is. Late January 43, following the, the uh, Casablanca Conference and Unconditional Surrender, he had rented out the entire top floor of a hotel in Istanbul. No, the top hotel in Istanbul. Yeah. The top luxury hotel. He did. It's like yeah. the Ritz-Carlton. He took <laughs> yeah, the yeah. entire top floor yeah. just for on, himself. On steroids, yeah. And while there, he's only there like maybe a week. And one evening, there's a knock on his door, and he opens the door, and standing there in front of him is Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, who is the chief of the Abwehr, German military intelligence. And Canaris has quite a history himself, but he was also a very a leading figure in the German underground, the resistance to Hitler. And Canaris uh, is very well known to him and vice versa. Earl invites him into his suite, they have a conversation, and Canaris lays it out for him and says, look, we will give you Hitler, dead or alive, but we have to have an armistice, and then we have to turn around and fight the Soviets. We have to keep them out of Europe because they're the civilizational threat to Europe. They will end everything that we hold in common. Uh, just, just, sure. Canaris was a formidable figure. Very. I mean, he was considered one of the, I mean, he was, a, he was, a, everybody knew he was amazingly smart, amazingly knowledgeable, and had the, had credibility among almost everyone uh, in the high command. That is correct. And a very wily fox is you know, how, how he was thought of. So mm -hmm. It was a credible offer. Yeah. And, had, and had, he himself had an, had an incredible career, uh, you know, going back to the Spanish Civil War and he had World War One service as well. Very intriguing figure, fascinating guy. But he's there, and you know, this is not some wishful thinking or vague concept. You know, uh, they had a very well thought out, established plan as to what units they knew were loyal, what units they knew would actually move on the Wolf Slayer, Hitler's Prussian East Prussian headquarters. That was the place down near Munich. No, no, no. This is up way up in oh, northern way up Germany. Germany. Up north in yeah, Russia. Okay. Where they were going to, how he was going to be seized, the method of cutting off communications. Right. So it was a very elaborate plan. And it was, um, anyway, so Canaris makes this very clear pitch to Earl and says, you know, please communicate this to FDR. We want this done. The sooner the better. And he says, I will recontact you in approximately four to six weeks. I hope to hear good news. Earl then immediately sends this message back via two different channels, via State Department and Naval uh, communications channels back to FDR. And he hears nothing, complete silence from the White House. And so he presses it again. And the, the last best word he gets is, well, bring it up with Eisenhower, which is sort of which means a circular rope-a-dope kind of answer. Yeah. Because if he brings it up with Eisenhower, Eisenhower is going to say, well, I'll talk to the president about it, right? So it's, just, it's, a, it's a logic loop. It goes around and around. Nothing comes out of it. And he's very frustrated by this. But not so frustrated that he doesn't continue to meet with the German resistance and plan, if they ever came through, how they would actually affect an armistice, uh, a link up on the ground, affect an armistice, and actually turn the game around against the Soviets. This is Bill Walton. I'm here with Chris Farrell and Shea Bradley Farrell. We're talking about Chris's book, 
I think she had a hand in exiled emissary she by did. George Earl. And <laughs> we're about to talk about the reasons why FDR might not have accepted the Nazis, Nazis, or the not the Nazis, but the German high, um, yeah, the offer resistance, the to, to, to end the war. Called. Yep. So let's talk about that. Goes into the White House, silent. Correct. Mm -hmm. Now, Diana West, who's been on the show, wrote a book mm -hmm. called American Betrayal. Absolutely. Yeah. And she gets into this in depth about who are the people surrounding FDR and what FDR's sympathies were yeah. then. Diana's book is brilliant, American Betrayal. It's pivotal, really. It's a foundational book. I think we everyone should read it. We both cite her book in our book. Yeah, exactly. And right. some other oh, by the her. way, uh, I, time, book plug, shameless plug. <laughs> 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 Last warning to the West, this is about <laughs> Hungary, and, and the events that happened in this, in the exiled emissary bear on what happened in Germany, Absolutely. And, and it's all sort of interrelated and fascinating. So, um, so what, we, we were Diana, talking about the yeah. Diana West, and, and we had Harry Hopkins, yep. who, was, who was, lived in the White House. In, in Link, he slept in Lincoln's bedroom for, what, three years? He did. And he was part of the pushback on Oral, correct? Yeah. I mean, one thing to look at is that when it comes to supporting underground resistance movements, whether it's Marshal Tito or the Free French or whoever you want to look at in Europe, FDR always loves subsidizing, financing, arming, equipping, training, you know, the, the full menu of services, anyone who is anti-fascist, but never, mm -hmm. never anybody who's anti-communist. Yeah, And, and that's, that's the hook in this whole... It, it really is. It's very interesting. And I'm sorry, Bill, did I No, no, you? I'm just... No, well, I'm, that's I'm one of the things that I get to in my book, because we have the Nazis rolling into Hungary um, in 1944 in March. Um, and, you know, our government was looking at the Nazis and the communists as different. And of course they are. But what I also try to make people understand is that they're both, they were both based on socialism. And Nazi is an acronym for national socialist. You know the word in, in German and I don't. Um, they're both different forms of socialism. They both take control. Uh, the, government, the government must have control of its people to make socialism work. And what was interesting in finding out uh, about Hungary is the Nazis treated the Hungarians the same as the communists did. They even had the same headquarters, the House of Terror, where they punished their and tortured their political opponents down in the basement. So the of Nazis the House of move Terror. out, and the next week the Soviets move in. Exactly. Correct. Same house, same rooms for torture. And in exactly some right. instances, the Nazis changed their uniform and were hired by the Soviets. <laughs> To they went right back to work. So anyway, that's literally they, they took off a black uniform, put on a green uniform, and and went back to doing the same thing that they were doing before. The other interesting this goes back to the intersection with Istanbul. The Hungarians had dispatched Admiral Horthy, who was the regent of Hungary, had dispatched a team. It really hangs on one person, but a, a diplomat to Istanbul who actually sort of pre-surrendered. Hungary to the British mm -hmm. on board the British ambassador's yacht yep. in the bay outside of Istanbul. And the, the Hungarians were trying to play sort of a double game where they were reaching out to the Allies, mostly to the OSS, saying, uh, we're ready to surrender. We don't want... They were in a squeeze play. They had the Nazis on one side and the Soviets on the other. And they're saying, we don't want either one. And would you please drop a team of OSS officers into Budapest to act as a buffer to keep both sides out. The OSS created a Budapest team. It was 50 some odd guys. They trained, they were prepared. They never were dropped into Budapest. This is another case of sort of lost history. Was, the, was, the, was the White House also involved in this non-intervention? Uh, non exactly correct. So, yeah, we really dropped the ball, and I didn't realize it until I started, as Chris says, uncovering lost history. You know, in 1945, for example, the Soviets came early, right at, around Christmas time, and sieged Budapest. Um, and right during that same time was Yalta with FDR, with Churchill, and Stalin 
where Stalin, we handed over to, to but, Stalin but, Central but, Europe. But the point, uh, I think I want to make this point stronger, though, because this was not just SBR, FDR sort of saying, gee, I, I, I sort of like Uncle Joe, Joe Stalin. But this mm -hmm. was, Diana West, and you write, all three of you write about the fact that the White House was not just Harry Hopkins, but there are lots of other people. Mm -hmm. Alger Hiss was the famous name. Sure. Lots of other people involved. Alger Hiss managed the in, Yalta in, in the FDR administration, who mm. were who were virulently pro-Soviet. I'll give yes. you a fun example. And some were spies. Here's a fun example of one. Lachlan Curry, which is not a very well-known name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, originally Canadian, becomes an American, works his way through all of FDR's alphabet soup agencies. He was in the Agricultural Adjustment Agency, all these different. But he kind of wheeled, wheedled his way through FDR's administration until he was working in the White House. Lachlan Curry, we know through the Venona decrypts, which were Army security agency uh, cables. They, they, had, they had grabbed every Soviet cable that was sent from D.C. back to Moscow during World War II, and they didn't bother to, to decrypt them until about 1946, mm -hmm. when someone said, you know, we got all these old Russian cables. Why don't we see what they were saying? And they decrypt them. They're referred to as Venona. That's the, the, the code name to these files. They were finally published in 1996. But Lachlan Curry is identified specifically with the cryptonym Page. Page was his code name. The, the, the Soviets didn't give code names to just anybody. They gave them to recruited assets who were collecting intelligence and, more importantly, running influence operations. They weren't interested in their ability to get their hands on secrets. They wanted agents in place to influence policy. Decisions, yeah. And so Lachlan Curry is in the White House. What was his job? What was his title? Uh, it, that's going to be a, a stump the chump questionnaire. I forget the exact title. <laughs> okay, he, he was, was in the White House. In the White House. House as a he was in, he was in the East Wing. Correct. And, and, or West and, Wing, rather. In a senior position. And yeah. he flees the United States like minutes before being arrested by the FBI. And he goes to Colombia and he's hanging out in Bogota, Colombia. The reason I mention this is because Teddy Kennedy, when he's thinking about making his run for the Senate to replace his older brother, JFK, who had become president, goes on a European tour, excuse me, goes on a Latin American tour to bolster his foreign policy credentials. I have the cables declassified from, from the State Department showing that when, when Teddy Kennedy made this Latin American tour, he specifically asked to meet with Lachlan Curry hmm. in Bogota, Colombia in 1961. He was emphatic about it. And Bill, things were So actually... ask yourself, I mean, you want to talk about influence operations. And things were actually suppressed by our government. Um, you know, when Earl came to FDR and told him that the Soviets had decapitated and thrown into these open graves the 20,000 intelligentsia, he said it was Nazi propaganda. Let me give the, for, the quick summary of that and then you okay. amplify. Sure. As I understand it, FDR asked George Earl to investigate the murder of 20,000 Poles, the cream of Polish society, head okay. of the military, head of the academic institutions, head of government, all that. These were not just random people. No, they murdered. weren't. And uh, FDR wanted him to come back and say that the Nazis did it, the Germans did it. Right. And instead, he came back and he said, no. Yeah, and he had papers. It, it, it was the Soviets that It was did the it. Soviets. He had the papers. He had eyewitnesses. He had all kinds of documentation to, to prove it. Um, and FDR dismissed it as Nazi propaganda. And the reason that the Soviets did this, this is the type of thing that they would do in each of the satellite countries, is they wanted to be able to control the social and civic organizations, the um, educational institutions. So you had to get rid of the people that might give you some pushback on that. Well, decapitate. I mean, well... Well, Literally Stalin, Stalin decapitated his own uh, his own army before correct. World War II. He killed what? How many? Fifteen thousand uh, of his top officers. That's correct. So, but, so the thing is, Bill, is that we were um, is the word 
uh, complicit, is that the right word? Mm -hmm. Complicit. Complicit in covering these things up because we find out decades later that, you know, the Soviets during uh, openness and transparency, they admitted finally that they had done the Katyn massacre. But uh, just to remind you this, let's talk about this too, because we helped cover up the Hitler-Stalin pact. Let's talk about that. Okay. The hot Hitler stuff. We yeah, everyone forgets that, uh, you know, in September of 1939, as Nazi Germany invades Poland, and they say, oh, look at this war of aggression, what the Nazis have done. And it's true. You know, no one will doubt it or deny it for a moment, nor should they. But uh, about nine days later, the Soviets invaded Poland from the east. Right. They're right. allied. They waged a war of aggression and carved up Poland. But the irony is, by the time we get to Nuremberg in 1945, who's sitting on the tribunal judging the Nazis for waging a war of aggression? The Soviets. The Soviets are. With us. Wasn't that something? <laughs> yeah. And we've handed yeah. back at Yalta, as Shay mentioned earlier, we've handed back at Yalta all of Central and Eastern Europe to, to Stalin, so, uh, which is what he negotiated. That's the Hitler-Stalin In the Hitler-Stalin but after after Truman died, then or after after Roosevelt died, Truman became president, and 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 Truman was equally skeptical of George Earl, was he not? He was. In fact, when Earl was pointing out, he, see, here's the other thing: while Earl is running around Istanbul, he is debriefing and meeting many many refugees from the Soviet Union and from Eastern Europe because they're all trying to escape through Istanbul because it's a neutral city. So Earl's been talking to everybody under the sun, doing these debriefings of very important figures from across the spectrum. And when he returns to the United States, he kind of carries the same message and says, look, the real threat is the Soviet Union. They're, we may have been allied during the war for whatever reason you want to explain, uh, but the, they're, they're a civilizational threat. And when, when he keeps pressing this point immediately after the war, Truman dismisses his commentary, his testimony before Congress at one point, and says that this, this Soviet communism thing, it's all just a bugaboo. Bugaboo is the right. word that Truman uses to dismiss Soviet communism. But can I, can I make this point? Because I want to make sure people understand this. Before the Nazi, Nazi Germany rolled into Poland, before Stalin rolled into Poland, they had made an alliance. The Hitler-Stalin pact was part of that alliance that nobody knew about for until the Nuremberg trials. And even then, we were skeptical about it. But the Hitler-Stalin pact actually divided up Central Europe between Hitler and between Stalin. And where we come in on this is fast forward to Yalta with FDR, Churchill, and Stalin. Stalin got exactly what he wanted in that pact that he had made with Hitler. We gave him the territory... You know, we didn't know it at the time that he had had this pact. But uh, the point is, is, you know, our government was supporting the Soviet Union. And at Yalta, when we gave him these satellite countries, Stalin, of course, promised that they were going to have free and fair elections. Uh, democracy was going to be upheld in these countries. He had no intention of that. And, you know, looking in my book, that's the history of Hungary that I trace. They had no intention of that. It was decades of oppression and taking people's freedom away from them and destroying the country. But it's just extremely ironic that we allowed that to happen. When, during the Nuremberg trials, when the Hitler-Stalin pact came out, we were, it was, our government was silent on it. It was even in a few newspapers in the U.S., but mainly we were totally silent about this. The uh, the Polish massacre, and then he he Earl was just they wouldn't believe him about that, and then he was rewarded with an assignment to uh, Samoa. <laughs> yeah. Right. So here's what happened. We're going to get this guy as far away from us as we can yeah. stand without eliminating him. So let's send him to Samoa. This March of nineteen March of 1945. Earl comes back to Washington, D.C., and uh, he detects a marked change in what's going on in the White House. Forrestal, who was then our Secretary of War, we still called it that, Forrestal, who was a conservative, well, meets was before with— Before politically correct. 
uh, it, it actually is war. But <laughs> anyway. Forrestal is meeting with Earl uh, in one of the ante rooms in the White House, and uh, he turns to Earl and says, the whole place has gone pink, which is sort of 1940s slang for, yeah. there are a bunch of commies, they're all lefties now. And even the people surrounding FDR had turned over to a certain degree and were markedly more hard over to the left. Earl finally gets in to see the president, and they discuss two things, two burning issues. Number one, why the hell didn't you ever answer me when I told you the Germans were ready to roll over and give you Hitler? But more importantly, the discussion of the Katyn Forest massacre that Shea mentioned earlier. It's quite a blow-up. They, they, I mean, they know each other. Earl still respects him as president, but he's also known him since he was like 18 or 19 years old. So he speaks to him in a way that is probably a little more frank than he's used to being spoken to. So it's a very frank, very heated conversation. And Earl says, look, it's probably best that I resign my commission as a, as a naval officer, and let me just go back to private business and goodbye, good luck. Uh, and he goes home, and that's the end of the meeting. Eventually, Earl, when he gets home, decides, you know what, uh, I need to tell FDR what I really think I'm going to do here. I've, I've thought this over. Whenever he writes to, Earl, uh, to FDR at this point, his, his mail is intercepted. It never actually gets to FDR. He knows this because of conversational tidbits that come up in, in their kind of back and forth. So he writes to FDR's daughter, Anne, and he includes a gift. A, a, a knife from a Moroccan prince that he had picked up along the way. And he says, by the way, pass this along to your dad and let him know that it's my intention to go to the press and Congress and explo explain to them all that I've learned about what the Soviet threat is. The response back to Earl is a letter, and I have it, FDR explicitly forbidding him to say anything about anything that he has learned as his personal emissary to the Balkans, or as a naval officer, or as an ambassador. He forbids him in any way. Earl writes back and says, you have my agreement. I won't say anything. As long as you're president, I won't say a word. Well, FDR then has a little special treat for him. And Enclosed Earl, was also a ticket to Samoa. Well, FDR, <laughs> Earl, right. Earl's out fishing at Deep Creek Lake, Maryland, and he sees a motorboat speeding toward him. And there's two FBI agents on board. And they grab him, and they bring him back to Washington. They stick him on a plane, and he's then 8,000 miles out in the Pacific uh, as the deputy governor yeah. of Samoa. Here's a man who's been governor, governor of Pennsylvania, he's a ambassador twice. Right? I wondered about that title. Yeah. They couldn't even make him governor. They, yeah, they made him a deputy, deputy governor, governor FDR's of Samoa. friend supported him. Yeah. So uh, not too long after that, FDR dies. And very shortly after that, uh, you know, Earl communicates back to Truman, okay, fun's fun, game is over, I'm coming home. <laughs> uh, and he does, in fact, return to the United States. So. so the lesson here, though, is that people, and I used to be in the skeptical camp. When, actually, when I first met Diana West, I was, oh, gosh, we're all these communists really in the in the White House. Yes, I, was, <laughs> yeah. I thought the same no. thing. I no. thought, you know, come on. But it turns out that... They it, really and, were. And, and you learned yes. a lot of this from previously unclassified documents. And I got, got a ton declassified as well yes. along the way. I, I went through the process. You, got, you went through the process. And, and so we, we learned that, in fact, what seemed to be just, you know, paranoia was, in fact, true. A hundred percent. So... Fast forward to today, now we're worried about whether there are people inside the United States government now who may be playing for the other team, the other team being China, that that could, in fact, be going on. Yeah, I mean, it's worse than that, uh, because it's not just China as a sort of an active opponent of ours. There is a societal shift, mm -hmm. right, yeah. where we have people who have glommed onto uh, this neo-Marxism, this globalism, and they've sworn their allegiance to it. They're, it's like a religion to them. This is above and beyond a political discussion that a Republican and a Democrat might have right. 20 or 30 years ago. This is something that they, they are, I mean, Obama described it perfectly. 
it's fundamental transformation. And, and uh, can I like, explain something? I mean, the reason that I wrote the book, Bill, uh, Last Warning to the West, is because the Hungarians were telling me that the rhetoric coming out of the United States reminded them of their Soviet era. So when I did that, you know, that's like a, a kick in the gut. But doing the research, and you look back, and my big point about all this is that we helped to spread communism. We helped to give Soviet, the Soviet Union these countries to foment this ideology, which was the goal of the common turn, the Communist International. I also didn't know if that was a real thing. I did the research. That was a real thing, too. Mm -hmm. And it has spread into this country. Um, progressivism is very similar to the tenets of Marxism. And, you know, again, I've done the research to pr prove all of that. But that's my big lesson, is that we have got to stop doing this. And and as you're saying, there are people in the government um, that are are very much standing up for Marxism. Well, if these ideas have taken hold, and they have taken hold, there are people, I guess one of the books was called Yours is Last Warning of the West. There's another one, War in the West. And my feeling is the West is committing suicide. Yeah, I agree with that. And it's done from, it starts in our universities and, and the hatred of the U.S. or the American institutions. and Correct. And, and loving all things globalism. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's and, a, it's a, it's a it's a, so we're we we've got you're right. There, China is an issue, but maybe the bigger issue, or is the war of ideas. Yes, the ideology, and that's you know we have loved Marxism, we have loved communism. This is what FDR did. At the same time, thinking that fascism was bad. Yeah, well, of got, course it it's is. It's got such a great track record too. Yeah, it it, it yeah. does. But you know, I I want people to understand that these are similar ideologies and that they control and kill a society. Yeah. Um, yes. Chris? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I've got, this is fantastic. We got to come back. I've, I've had a chance to do, <laughs> do, do duets here. These are both tremendously interesting reads, and I think you need to understand this because what's going on then is going on now. Let's stop it. We've got to stop it. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. It's always a pleasure. There should, you, there should be airports and bridges named after George Earl, and he has been airbrushed out of history. Well, no more. We're going to get your. We're going to get this book more widely read and, <laughs> and see if we can't resurrect it as a warning to the West now. Uh, and you can catch Chris on his own podcast, Judicial Watch. Uh, your show is called On Watch. On Watch. Shay, you don't have a podcast yet. I feel like I need one. Everybody right? I know has a podcast. We all need a podcast. I'll get on that, Bill. I'll get on that. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, great, great talk with you guys. We'll be talking Always again, I'm pleasure. sure, soon. Thank you, Bill. And, uh, to be continued. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you for joining. As, you, yeah, as, as always, you can catch us on all the podcast platforms and on Rumble and on YouTube, on uh, CPAC now and Monday nights. And uh, sign up. If, Subscribe if you haven't already done so, and also get your friend to friends to subscribe and uh, drop us a note, email to let us know what else you'd like us to be covering. So, thanks and uh, stay tuned. We'll talk soon.